uh, let's see, we talked about the phases of matter, solids, liquids, gases, and the phase change. Uh, this diagram is pretty important. I might have to give you this diagram and ask you to explain it on the test. And we have a couple things going on. We have energy that's pouring into this substance. And when it's just going between the, like going up to the, boil, the freezing point in this case, it just increases the temperature. So if I have ice at negative 20, if I put in energy, I raise its temperature up to zero. And then I have to put in extra energy. This is this latent heat. This is called the latent heat of fusion right, that, that goes from a solid to a liquid. I have to put in that extra heat in order to break those bonds and make it go from a solid to a liquid. That's called our latent heat of fusion. And then I add more energy, and that increases the temperature of the water up to a certain point, up to 100 degrees. Up here, I have 100 degree water. It's not steam yet. It's just 100 degree liquid. Uh, and then as I add more energy, I convert some of that water to steam. So if I have 100 degree water and 100 degree steam, the steam has a lot more energy in it. That's why steam burns hurt worse than water burns because it just has a lot more energy when the steam goes onto your skin. It deposits all this latent heat of vaporization onto your skin. And similarly, that's why sweating works so well as a mechanism for cooling because when your sweat goes from a liquid to a vapor phase on your skin, it takes away all of that latent heat of vaporization. And it turns out the latent heat of vaporization is a lot of energy. Uh, and notice here, the latent heat of fusion is just this much energy, but the latent heat of vaporization is quite a bit more than that. And then once you get past that, you just increase its uh, energy, the temperature rather, as you put energy into it. Eventually, you'll get to a plasma state where that gas is completely ionized. You, you rip apart the bonds between the protons and the electrons, like you get in that glass ball with that stuff, or like you get on the surface of the sun, which, you know, is really, really hot. All right, uh, calorimetry, I have a little clip I want to share with you in just a second. What did I want to say about calorimetry? Okay, well, calorimetry is just a study. of energy and how it changes temperature. How temperature changes or how phase changes with the addition of that energy, like in this chart. We often use this equation, our Q equals MC delta T. You're not going to have to do any calculations, but I do want you to be familiar with this. And I think that we've already actually covered this. Am I right? Let me go back up and see. Did we cover Q equals C delta T? I told you what all the things were. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, all this business. Um, in particular, we're concerned you can use calorimetry to figure out the uh, caloric content or the energy content of certain foods. The way they do this, and I'll share a little clip with you, is they use a device called a calorimeter. In particular, they're going to use a bomb calorimeter, but we can just call it a calorimeter. It's sort of like your cup there. It's just a device that is really well insulated, so a very well insulated cup, basically. Um, then their calorimeter, they'll put some food stuff inside of it. They'll close it off. And then they explode the thing. They measure the temperature. We put a thermometer in here. Um, they blow up the food and measure the temperature increase. I know, doesn't it? I'm going to play you a little clip where they actually determine the caloric content of, of uh, what's it called, fruitcake, right, right, fruitcake. Uh, they put it into a bomb calorimeter. They explode it. Now, they use a certain amount of energy to blow it up. It's, they set it on fire, basically. They use a certain amount of energy to do so, but they know the amount of energy that they use for that. But what they're looking for 
is how much does this little thing, how much does it cause the temperature to increase over what you should expect it to increase? And by doing so, if you know this change in temperature, then you can figure out what heat is produced by that material. There are other ways to figure out the specific heat uh, that are just different. So let's listen to this clip. You need to have sort of a basic idea of how this calorimetry can be used to determine the, the content of energy in foodstuffs. All right, that's fairly interesting, right? How they determine the caloric content of food. It's just through this method of calorimetry. You uh, blow it up, and then you see what is the extra increase in temperature. You could do the same like with a piece of wood, right? You set it on fire and see how much heat is generated by that piece of wood. And then that would tell you how much energy is contained within the, the physical structure of the wood. So there's not some table somewhere. I mean, there are tables, of course, that tell you how many calories are in a cherry or a nut or whatever. But the way these food manufacturers actually determine the caloric content is through the use of a bomb calorimeter. Okay? You know with me on this? All right, let's move into the second section of this chapter. Actually, uh, we did these questions already, right? And these two. Uh, let's look at methods of heat flow. There are three methods for heat flow that I talked about in your book and, you know, that, that exist. These are conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction requires contact between two surfaces. Convection requires a flow of fluids. We'll talk about each of these. And then radiation occurs without either contact or the flow of fluids. So conduction, two objects come together and they touch, or they touch through some other material, like, for example, sticking the marshmallow fork in the fire, and then the fork gets hot, and then I get hot. That is by conduction. Convection is like in a convection oven. In a convection oven, what does a convection oven have inside of it? It's just a normal oven, but with a what? A fan. A fan that blows the air around, and that allows your oven to cook more quickly. Uh, otherwise, your oven heats by radiation, which is where you just have uh, light, light waves, infrared radiation, that will come from one source and go to another and actually heat it up. Like the sun heats up the planet Earth. Not all infrared, it's other types of radiation, too. We'll get into that later. Uh, the rate of conduction. Now, we've seen rates before. This is the uh, heat over time, Q over T. That is the rate at which a material gains or loses heat. And the rate of conduction is given by this formula. This is on your equation sheet, so you don't need to memorize it. But you do need to understand how the different variables are affected. Uh, K, A, delta T, divided by the distance D. Uh, K is something we talked about last time. Remember we had the, the plastic block and the aluminum block? We said that the one felt colder, okay? One felt colder than the other for a particular reason, a physical property of those. What, what do we call that? Same reason why my daughter likes sleeping on the fuzzy blanket instead of the cold sheets. Why do the sheets feel colder? Because of the sheets. Thermal conductivity, right. So the sheets conduct heat away from your body more quickly than does the fuzzy blanket. By the way, you can have a cotton fuzzy blanket and a cotton sheet. They're made of the same material. Why do they have different rates of thermal conductivity? You ever thought about that? There's what? No, it's not really the thickness. It's sort of the thickness. You're on the right track, but that's not really it. Why would a sheet have a higher rate of thermal conductivity than a fuzzy blanket? Huh? Getting closer and closer. It's not just the fuzzy blanket that you're laying on. What else is it that you're laying on? Do you know where? The texture? Yes. The, the fuzzy blanket is what? It's fuzzy, right? Like your jacket? And what's all wrapped up in those fuzzy balls? Do we more? No, yeah, no, not really. Huh? What? Air, right? Those fuzzy blankets, they're good insulators because they have lots of air. They hold and they capture air. And air is an excellent, excellent insulator. In fact, your, your uh, styrofoam ice chests, you know what they're made of? Air, right? They're just air, right? They inject those little pockets of styrofoam with air. And the styrofoam is just a thing to hold the air in place. 
if you can have a, a really ideal insula, a really ideal ice chest, it'd be just air. Like you wouldn't even have the styrofoam; it'd just be air. In fact, often if you use a calorimeter, we have some upstairs. They're two metal cups, but metal's a terrible. I mean, a great conductor of energy. So why would we use metal cups? We put one inside the other, so the uh, the the inner cup is surrounded by a pocket of air. Air is an excellent insulator. Okay, so anyway, the thermal conductivity is K. K is the area. Delta T is the difference in temperature. And then D is the distance from the distance between the two objects. So if we look at these, and you guys have sort of said a lot of these already, but if I increase my area, which is sort of what Dre was getting to, that if I increase my surface area, then in fact, he was right, that our rate of thermal energy exchange does increase. And with the sheets, you're right, you do have an increased surface area because of they're sort of stretched out flat. If I have a, a greater difference in temperature, I also have a greater rate of energy transfer or heat transfer. So if I go outside in the cold weather, my body temperature will be affected more than if I go outside on a, you know, a, a 95 degree day or so. Because there's a greater difference between the outside temperature and the temperature of my body. And then the distance is also important. Right? That's why those marshmallow forks that we got, they work a lot better because they extend out to a longer length. You know what I'm talking about? You can get the cheap ones that just are like this long, which is what we've had for many years. Or now, now that we're making the big bucks, we got the extendable marshmallow forks. And they're much nicer because the, you increase that distance D, and then uh, they don't transfer nearly as much energy. Right? Because if I increase D, I decrease Q over T. So know how those different variables come and interplay and be able to describe to me, well, what happens to the rate of energy transfer if I do something to one of these variables? The thermal conductivity, that would be changing the material. Say going from a metal rod to a wooden stick, that would decrease the rate of energy transfer because wood has a higher K value than does metal. The area of the change in temperature and the, uh, the distance between the objects. And not the change in temperature, excuse me, the difference in the temperature. I have one object over here at a certain temperature, another object over here at a certain temperature. What is the rate at which they transfer energy? All right, a uh, couple of the other two, which I just sort of put these in reference. Actually, so regarding conduction, you need thermal contact. We've talked about that before. Thermal contact can mean that the two surfaces are touching, or it can mean that the two objects that you're concerned about are connected in some way by some material, like the marshmallow fork. That puts me into contact, my hand into contact, thermal contact anyway, with the fire. Convection. Requires the flow of, of a fluid. I said a good example is a convection oven. It greatly uh, decreases your cooking times. And then radiation is the transfer of energy by light waves. We're going to have a whole chapter on light later in the semester, so we'll, we'll not deal with that. Yeah, is that? Uh, you sort of do have the objects, the, the fluid comes into contact. But like in an oven, if we think about an oven, so this is my oven. You know, this is the hot part, right? And then I have my pan with my bread or whatever inside of it. The bread never actually comes into contact with the hot part, right? And it sits on the rack, but it's basically suspended right in the middle of the oven. And so the oven, in a convection oven anyway, 
Where you have a fan. It blows air currents all throughout that oven, and that increases the cooking time, or decreases the cooking time, because when you transfer the fluid, now you're right, the fluid comes into contact with the material, but uh, the oven and the cake, they never actually come into contact with one another. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so you're right in thinking that the fluid does come into contact with the material, but that's not that's really something that transfers the heat. That's a good question. Thank you for clarifying that. The oven actually also operates by another principle. What is that? In fact, it's, this is its main way of transferring energy. Which is it? Is it conduction, convection, or radiation? It is radiation, yeah. So the oven primarily operates. You get the outer part of the oven really hot, or you actually usually have an, a burner element down here, and it radiates out energy. You never actually come into contact with that element, right? And if you don't have a convection oven, you don't have any transfer of fluid flow in the oven. It's all by radiation. It puts out radiation that cooks your food. Again, we'll talk about that later in the semester. Um, all right, let's, any questions about that? Conduction, convection, radiation? Know how they operate for conduction. Know how they relate to those different variables. So you'll have the equation. And uh, know some examples of each. All right, energy in the body. A governing principle is going to be the conservation of energy. And if you recall, the conservation of energy, this is all based on this principle of a closed system. And so we'll, we'll sort of think of the body as a closed system. I mean, of course, you put food into the body, and you do lose energy from the body, but we'll largely think of it as a closed system. Um, and so in this closed system, we have to account, if we're thinking of it as a closed system, we have to account for energy that leaves and enters the system. That is, you know, when you eat food, that's energy that's put into your system. And then when you exercise, or just as you live, like the basal metabolic rate, what we'll get into, that's just the energy of your body living, doing the, the things that your body needs to do to function. Also, when you work, you consume energy. So if I do a force over a displacement, then I consume energy because I'm doing work. And this is the work energy theorem at its very basic level. And uh, the body can use energy for macro. That's like exercise, for example, or walking around or whatever. Our micro purposes, this sort of gets into our basal metabolic rate. I expect you all know what that means if you haven't yet. We'll get to it later. But, you know, it is the... The way that our body uses energy just to live. Our heart beats, our cells do different things. Uh, the energy required to live. Our food is the primary source of energy. It can be stored for short-term purposes. What's short-term energy called? Starts with a G. You know? Glycogen, yeah. And it can be stored for long term storage, fat. Um, and so, but food is our primary source of energy, and our bodies have different ways of storing that energy. Uh, this energy from food, the unit for energy is the calorie, it's the capital C calorie, as you're probably aware. And that's different from the lowercase c calorie. Uh, a calorie, lowercase c, is the amount of energy re to require the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one milliliter of water. And do you know what the mass of a milliliter of water is? You know? It's a gram. Did y'all know this? Y'all knew this, right? Did you know that? No? Do you know why? Doesn't that seem strange to you? 
that water, which is such a common substance that we use, that one milliliter of water would be exactly one gram in mass? Doesn't that seem strange? Why would that be? Huh? It is by design. Right? Not that like God designed water to be one milliliter to be one gram, but that um, that that's how we define what a gram is. Now remember, we have a certain standard for kilogram, whether it's that cylinder in France, right? Soon to be that silicone sphere, the number of atoms of silicone. But if you recall, we watched that video with Derek. Remember the video where he describes sort of the history of the standard of mass? It used to be the very first standard for the kilogram was a liter of water. A liter of water is a thousand milliliters. A kilogram is a thousand grams. So that's why one milliliter of water is one gram of, of water. That's just a little trivia to impress your friends. Um, so to raise that by one degree Celsius. Not one degree Fahrenheit, because one degree Fahrenheit would be different than one degree Celsius. Is this a greater increase in temperature? Or a lower increase in temperature than one degree Fahrenheit. It's greater, right? A degree Celsius is bigger than a degree Fahrenheit. And so a food calorie, what we call a food calorie, is one kilocalorie. And if you recall, kilo is a thousand uh, calories. And that's equal to one capital C calorie which is a, uh, a food calorie. All right? Uh, we have three sources. Your book goes into this. You need to be familiar with them. But if you've had dietetics, I'll talk about the three types of foods, right? The three types of energy, the food sources. Uh, you got the uh, carbs, the lipids, and the proteins. Carbohydrates. Lipids. That's just a fancy word for what? That's right. Your oils and the like. Um, and then your proteins. Each of these have a certain energy density. Do you know which of these has the most energy density? That is the amount of energy, the number of calories per gram, the amount of energy per unit mass. Which of these, carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins, have the highest energy density? Don't answer that. Let's do it as a quicker question. All right, which of these has the highest energy density? Well, I'm sorry, give me a moment. We're going to need this anyway, so let's get it going. You just hold on. I'll tell you in just a minute. <laughs> Let me deal with this first a second. So, which of these has the greatest energy density, A, B, or C? Carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins? Which has the greater energy density? You probably know the answer, even if you haven't had a class on it. But uh, if you did the reading, you know. Carbohydrates have four kilocalories per gram, which has the highest. I'm going to stop at uh, 37, 37. Look at y'all. None of this, right? So lipids have. Um, have an energy density of about twice that, 9 kilocalories per gram. 
And then proteins have the same as carbohydrates, roughly. Four kilocalories per gram. All right, so lipids have a greater energy density. And uh, I don't have a joke for you. I just sort of have a story that was kind of funny. I went to the new Capital One Bank, the one down on Canal, you know what I'm talking about? And it was fancy. Like, it looked all very modern and stuff. And I w we went up there because we had some issues, like, with our, our bank account. We were missing some money, and I just didn't really know where it was. So I went up to the clerk, and I, I just told her that I needed her to check my balance. She pushed me. True story. True. All right. So um, you heard that one before, Daisy? Good. Is it called Nutrients? Collectively, other nutrients include vitamins and minerals and water. But they provide nutrition to our body. All right. Uh, energy from carbs is delivered most quickly to the body. You know, which is delivered most slowly, the lipids or the proteins? Which one do you know? Amber, you know? Lipids is right. That's right. And lipids is delivered the most slowly. Uh, this might change, and your dietetics might have told you, but this is what the book said about what nutritionists recommend. They recommend 50 to 60% carbs. Am I, is the book wrong in that? Is that right? That's still right. I know the book, is that's what the book says, or that's what other, I know the book says that. I just don't know if it's still. Yeah. I just don't know if that's the sort of the, the going distribution. Dietetics people, do y'all know, is that sort of the, the recommended bit for a normal person? You believe so? All right. This book is kind of old, so I know that changes as people learn new things. Uh, what are some sources of each of these for carbs, lipids, and protein? You can know just sort of a few basic sources for these. What are some sources for each of these? Okay, Brad, what is that? Carbs. What are some other sources of carbs? Carb. Pasta, potatoes, rice. What about for lipids? Uh, what? Oils. Are you kidding? Okay. All right. Oil, what else? Uh, yeah. For lipids? <laughs> <laughs> These are fats, right? So oils, butter, stuff like that. Uh, and then protein, Taylor? Eggs are a good source of protein. Right? I'm right in that, right? Eggs are a good source of protein. Meat, fish, beans, yeah. Tofu. Any vegetarians in the class? I'm not, but you don't have to tell me if you want. Okay. I started running with this guy. He was on the cover of Runner's World. He was like the runner of the year. Josh Majani, I think is his name. You know what I'm talking about? He was in POV some months ago, too. But he's a vegetarian. He runs 70 miles a week. And he's a vegetarian. I, I mean, I guess he ha you have to eat protein and you have to eat carbs. I guess, I don't know. I guess he eats a lot of beans and stuff. All right, so let's try these clicker questions. The four one on the left. What are the three sources of energy? Carbs, what and what. And then if you finish that one, go on and think about this next one. I'll we'll stop here in just a few seconds. I'll stop at 32, 32.
All right, look at y'all. Carbs, proteins, and lipids. Uh, vitamins and minerals are also nu nutrients, but they don't provide us energy. They provide things that our body needs, but they're not sources of energy per se. All right, let's try this next one. I have an object, it transfers energy at 2 kilocalories per second. What if I make the object twice as wide or twice as thick? What happens? All right, we'll stop at uh, 43, 43. All right. Now, why don't you ask your neighbor what they put, and you'll talk about it for a second. Now, think about, is the rate of thermal conduction, if I make this material wider, is the rate of thermal conduction, is it going to go up or down? I mean, thicker, yeah, thicker. So, uh, you know, it gets thicker, the material. Bless you. Ask your neighbor what they put, okay? I know what you are thinking. You're thinking, is this area or is this distance? Which is it? All right. All right so uh, ask your neighbor what they put. Put in your final answer. We'll stop at 130, 140. We'll stop at 140. Okay. A is right. Because, look. It's like the marshmallow fork, right? The marshmallow fork that we have, the old ones that we used to have are really short. That's the distance D. But if I make them longer, I don't have as high a rate of thermal conductivity. In fact, if I increase D by a factor of 2, this goes down by a factor of 2. And so the thickness is referring to um, you know, how thick the material is. Let me draw a picture to try to describe this. So let's say that I have two objects. And they are separated by distance d. There's a certain material that is between them that has a thickness d. And then I make them further apart so that now this material is twice its original length. It's 2d. And that means that when the rate of thermal in it thermal conduction was 2 kilocalories per second, now it's going to be smaller. It's going to be one kilocalorie per second. All right. Now, hold on a second. Let me. I, I think I might answer your question before you ask it. There is another way that I can think about it. That I have this material it has an area A. That's like the area of the material that's making contact. But what if I made the material have a contact area that is 2A. In that case, I would go from 2 kilocalories per second to 4 kilocalories per second. And I think that you'll probably understand. I think it was just a matter of the definition of what is the thickness. And if I have that on the test, I'll try to make it clear. But, Zach, what are you going to ask? Okay, Taylor. Now, the distance D uh, here or here? Okay, now right here, the, the, the thickness of this material that's between these two objects doubles. So that means the two objects get further apart. And so the heat that's traveling from one to another has to go through more material to get to the other one. Yeah, it's getting, getting wider. Stefan, you had a question? As you add in more material here, or rather, as it gets, as it has to travel through a longer distance, D, 
the rate of thermal conductivity decreases. Just like the marshmallow fork, the extendable marshmallow forks, I extend them so the thermal energy has a further distance to travel, and that means less thermal energy is going to get through, or at least at a lower rate, so it doesn't burn you. Bless you. All right. We're good with that? You will have some questions. I'll try to be very clear in the questions about what actually is changing. Maybe I'll include a figure or something. But if I, inc if I increase the thickness of the material, then my rate of thermal conductivity goes down. But look, if I increase the thermal, the contact area, I just make it have more contact, but I keep the same thickness, then the rate of thermal conductivity goes up. All right. Let's look at work done by the body. Um, So this has to do with macroscopic work. Remember we talked about microscopic and macroscopic? And macroscopic largely means sort of, you know, big motions that you do with the body. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to know the energy required to climb one flight of stairs of a person that's climbing these stairs, well, those are big steps, aren't they? They have to go up to the stairs their gravitational potential energy is going to change by a certain amount. That U is equal to MGH. The mass of a person, gosh, what is a person usually in the mass in kilograms, typical person? Roughly. You have any idea? No clue at all? It would be like, I don't know. 100 kilograms, 200 kilograms, 300 kilograms, 50 kilograms. Just guessing. It is, a typical person is about 70 kilograms. So, you know, 50 is sort of a smallest person, 100, 120, 150 is, you know, like big football player. So, 70 kilograms times 10, that's our acceleration due to gravity, times h. Well, what height are we going? Let's say a height of about, um, I don't know, three meters, about nine feet. And so this is approximately equal to about 2,000 joules. And 2,000 joules is approximately equal to about a half a calorie. So if I, con if I climb a f one flight of stairs, that's about a half of a food calorie. Um, so, if you were to climb 200 flights of stairs, then you would only burn 100 calories. Not not little c, but big c calories. <gasps> Is that how you ever been on a stair stepper or whatever? 100 flights of stairs, that's a lot of stairs. And you only burn like 100 calories? Does that make any sense to you at all? What's that? That's big C. Yeah, so those are like food calories. This is a big C, too. Yeah, so this is a big C. 2,000 joules is about a half a kilocalorie. Well, because if we look, if I do an hour of stair climbing, which might be about 200 flights, uh, an hour of stair climbing can just sort of get it off of the, the little reed they tell you on the thing over at the rec center. An hour of stair climbing is about 400 to 600 calories. So why why is there this difference? If I climb 200 flights of stairs, the amount of energy that I would need is only 100 calories. But why, if I climb 200 stairs, my body actually burns not 100, but it burns four to 600 calories? Any idea? Yeah, yeah, sort of. I mean, you, yeah, your body is just not terribly efficient. That your muscles are very, uh, very inefficient. I know I said the other day that muscle, the body is more efficient, is quite efficient, but in comparison to a car, which is 
Uh, it's only like 10 or 20 percent efficient. But anyway, the muscles are very inefficient. They typically only have a um, a 20 percent efficiency. So if you climb stairs for an hour and you burn, say, 500 calories, by what amount have you increased your potential energy? All right. Think back to our efficiency and how we calculate efficiency. If I'm 20% efficient, that means that 20% of everything that I, of the energy that I use, actually goes into usable energy, and 80% is just lost, then by how much have I increased my potential energy if I burn 500 calories, big C calories? Let's do it as a quicker question. I'm 20% efficient. I take in a total, a burn a total of 500 calories. How much of that energy becomes usable energy? That is, how much of it has actually been used to increase my potential energy? By how much have I actually climbed stairs? That would increase my potential energy by that amount. How much of it is actually usable? 400 calories of energy? 200? 100 or 300 calories of energy. All right, many of you have the right answer. About nine of you have the right answer. But still, a handful of y'all do not. So y'all, ask your neighbor what they put, please. And um, if you're different, Try to explain to one another. All right, that's a little bit better. I'm going to stop at a 120. 120. If you haven't clicked in yet, just guess. 120. Okay, good. C is the right answer. If I'm at 20% efficiency, 20% is like one-fifth, right? What is one-fifth of 500? 100. So if I'm 20% efficient, that means I only get 20% of the total energy I put in comes out as a usable form of energy. And so here I would say one-fifth or 20% of 500 is what? Well, 20% of 500 is equal to 100. Likewise, if I asked how much energy is that just lost to heat or whatever, then it would be what's left over, which is 400 calories. But you get usable energy at about 20%. All right, let's look at metabolism. This is fairly interesting, actually. And I'm sure that you guys do this a lot more than then we'll go to into this class and your others. But biochemical reactions in the body. Uh, that use energy. To build up or tear down substances. So it's basically, you know, these microscopic things that go inside of your body. The metabolic rate is the rate of energy usage in the body. This includes uh, all the energy that you use. Uh, to measure the metabolic rate, I don't know if you've ever done this, but this is very interesting. You submerge a person in a, in a tub of water. And measure the rise in the temperature of the water. 
have advice to this back there where you guys work? That's right, trainers. Measure a metabolic rate of a person. With a radar, we'll actually go over to the rec center at the end of the semester. And they have a device over there that you can stand on and you put your hands on. You ever seen this, Carolyn? You put your hands on it. It sends a, a small electric current through your body. And it measures the density of your body. It measures your muscle mass, water mass, all that business. And we'll talk about that later when we get into electricity. But it also reports your metabolic rate. Now, this is operates, it, that does it by estimating, it says, okay, you have this much muscle mass, muscle uses this much energy, and so it's sort of an estimate. But this is more direct measurement of your metabolic rate, because this works kind of like a bomb calorimeter, right? You freeze dry a person, you put them into a little bullet-like thing, and then you inject them into the bomb calorimeter, and then you explode them, and then you measure the change in temperature. It works sort of like that, except without the freeze drying and the exploding and all that. You just put your body into a vat of water, and then you say, what temperature increase do you see in that vat of water? And that tells you something about the amount of energy that your body is using. Let's see, I think I have a video about this. Am I right? Yeah, I have like a little news program where they talk about um, measuring the metabolic rate. There are different ways to measure metabolic rate, but one way, as I said, is to take a person, it's a little bit different, you put them into a tub of water, and then you measure the, uh, the change in temperature of the water, and then that tells you how much energy they're actually putting into that water. What is their metabolic rate? All right. The basal metabolic rate is the rate at which body converts um, Therm, uh, converts energy into thermal energy while resting. In that video clip, they sort of talk about this a little bit. Uh, thermal, excuse me. Uh, this is just sort of the energy required to, you know, to live. And your basal metabolic rate can be various, different for different people, but everybody has roughly the same basal metabolic rate, you know, within an order of magnitude anyway. Uh, so let's say that your basal metabolic rate is 65 calories per hour. That is, if you're just sitting around, your body needs 65 calories just to live, for your heart to beat, for your brain to function, for you to breathe. Uh, then, if in one day then, if that's your basal metabolic rate, then how many calories do you need in a single day? So in one day at 24 hours, how many calories do I need just to live during that day and not have any physical activity? All right, let's stop at uh, 55, 55. Okay, good. B is right. I want to say 65 calories per hour, capital C, times 24 hours for one day. And that'll tell me how many calories per day I have. Uh, let's see, I can make this easier. I can just say 70 times 20. And that'll give me roughly the same answer. That's about 1,400. You'll see what I did. I sort of rounded them down or off, rounded them up or down. And so the one that's closest to that is the 1,600. So just to live, typical person needs, you know, 1,500 to 2,000. And that's going to differ based on how much muscle mass you have, how much, uh, how big you are, how tall you are, how thin you are. Your basal metabolic rate will change based on those factors. Uh, but it's going to be order of magnitude roughly the same for, for most people. Order of mag like within a factor of, you know, 10 or so. All right, let's see. Um, Younger people, and tall, thin people tend to have higher BMRs because either they're growing, and that just requires a lot of energy to grow, or for tall, thin people, you might say, oh, duh, a tall, thin person has a 
bigger BMR, that's why they're taller and thinner. But there's actually a feedback because as you get taller and thinner, your body just requires more energy to regulate its temperature. You get cold more often, and your body needs more uh, ability to keep you warm. Is that's right, Kai? You get cold. Yeah. So a tall, thin person just requires more energy to heat their bodies. So then they have a larger BMR, or which have a, excuse me, which have a larger surface area. If you have a larger surface area, that's because you're tall and thin. Then it just requires more energy to heat your body. In fact, you guys ever listen to the Get Fit guy? Ever listen to the Get Fit guy? He has a podcast. I know we're almost done, but he has a podcast on uh, on iTunes. I forget what it's called, but it's called the Get Fit Guy, and uh, it's very interesting, especially for athletic trainers, because he talks a lot about a uh, you know human performance and sports and just you know what does the body do. And one of the things I, I listened to him once, and he said that every morning what he does in order to sort of jumpstart his metabolism is he takes a cold shower. Isn't that something? Y'all take cold showers in the morning? <laughs> I don't either. But he takes a cold shower because your body requires energy in order to, to warm itself. And by taking a cold shower, as cold as he can get it, even in the wintertime, he says, as cold as he can get it, then... Um, it kickstarts your metabolism and sort of gets it going for the day. Take a cold shower in the morning, okay? Although it's hard to take cold showers around here because the body water is so darn warm. But y'all have a good day, okay? See you, uh, what's today? See you next week. Have a good weekend.